we're going to go ahead and get started. So I wish to uh, convene uh, the February day before Valentine's Penn Branch Citizen Civic Association meeting of 2018. So welcome. Uh, we have a full agenda here. Uh, we have a few items. Normally at the beginning of each meeting, we cover a few household meetings. Uh, but in respect for time, I will keep things paced and moves along. Um, as you all well know, and as we sit on the listserv, um, we have Chief uh, Peter Newsham here. So we will take questions, we'll moderate those questions, uh, but we'll get started in a few minutes. So I uh, can encourage everyone to get some food while you can. But right now, we're going to start with a couple of uh, uh, household uh, business that we need to uh, take care of. First, we're going to start with our Treasurer's Report uh, by Matt Bernardi. Uh, Matt? Well, we'll start with our Treasurer's uh, Report in a few minutes as soon as Matt. Uh, I forgot he's at the door, probably collecting memberships. So we'll do committee reports. I know this month we have something very important to discuss, so we'll start with our Education Committee Chair, Marla Dean, uh, who has a couple of things that we uh, would like to make sure we highlight, and we'll quickly go through our reports. Marla, you can, uh, if you want to stand right here in the mic so we can hear you. Good evening, I'm Marla Dean. I'm the Education Chair in two, um, well, three real quick announcements. The first one is that um, there's a petition that the mayor put out about DC tax. If you don't know what DC tax is, it's a tuition assistance grant that really levels the playing field for DC residents because we don't have a number of in-state colleges. We have our children have to pay out-of-state tuition. We, um, children get ten thousand dollars a year, up to ten thousand dollars a year, toward their um, out-of-state tuition at a public university that offsets the um, cost of going to college. The Trump administration is attempting to end this grant program, and so it has um, devastating effects on children throughout D.C. There's a petition that the mayor put out. I will be sending out that link. I want everyone to please sign that petition. It has drastic um, impact. I already have my former students who are in college now calling in a panic because they heard about it and that they know that that money will be cut. So that is a really important issue as DC citizens we need to mobilize around. So I want to put you on notice for that. It is impacting, it's not your children, your nieces, your nephews, your grandchildren, any um, child who's headed to college in college currently. Secondly, um, we have our committee meeting tomorrow, I know, Valentine's Day, 7.30 at the Francis Gregory Library for the Education Committee. Please come out. That's really important. We host that in conjunction with Hillcrest Education Committee. And thirdly, um, there are a number of oversight um, meetings that have been going on around education. Hot button issues include what's going to happen to um, Fletcher Johnson. Now, why am I drawing from the school in Hillcrest? Come on, Earl. What's the name of the um, elementary school in Hillcrest? Uh, and Beers. No, no, no. The one that closed. Uh, uh, Winston. Winston. Right. Around what's going to happen to those properties. So that really impacts our community and the education um, pipeline for DCPS. So a lot of interesting conversations are going on. Please come out. Please be involved. Please sign the petition. Um, there are a lot of things going around on around education in D.C. That's it. Thank you very much, Marla. Uh, and I'd like to recognize Marla because Marla recently received an award. Uh, Marla, Marla is also a principal and been very active in the area of education. So it's a lot of work we do on the committees and a lot of work that happens in between these meetings. So I always like to recognize our committee chairs. Other things uh, in terms of announcement, I'd like to note, uh, note that Dan and Megan McGrath, uh, who are our block, part, uh, block captain and who also manage our newsletter, um, they gave birth to a daughter uh, about two weeks ago. Uh, she was almost a month overdue, so it, it took her a while to get back. <laughs> Let's just say it took her a while to get an attitude adjustment, so I finally went over there at least two weeks later. Uh, she's got an eight and a half pound baby at birth, so they're adjusting. Let's just say that. Um, and then on another note, we do have some very sad news. Uh, some of you might have noticed there were some ambulances. Um, that were on the uh, 3500 block of Highwood Drive on Sunday. Uh, one of our neighbors who frequently attended this meeting, Pierre Armand, 
uh, passed of a heart attack suddenly. Uh, Pierre was very outspoken, very active in the community. You can see Pierre walking through the neighborhood with her um, grandchildren and also kids that she babysat. So uh, we really do want to hold the family up in prayer. We're going to do a lot to support. I did speak with her husband, of course, who was understandably uh, upset, um, and her children who are in the neighborhood, many of whom uh, we know. So we will be doing what we can to support them and support the family. Uh, Pierre was 62 years old. Wow. Um, and if you saw Pierre, very active, very health, uh, very healthy, appeared very healthy. And I can tell you, uh, slender lady. So when you think of someone having a heart attack, um, that suddenly, I mean, it's sad, but it does happen. And it does show you that you can't look at his individual and predict a heart attack. So uh, we'll be sending out our notices and stay tuned on the Penn Branch listserv. So just want to make sure that you're aware. Just like I said, reach out to the family. Penn Branch will do whatever we can uh, for our Penn Branch members during this time, you know, this time of difficulty for them and their family. Uh, Pierre also lost her son. It's been about maybe about eight years ago. So that family has had a rough go. So again, we want to be able to support them. Uh, so I'll keep you posted on that. Um, with that, I don't know if there's any other notices. Are there any other? Well, we do want to make sure uh, we need to approve our minutes uh, from the last uh, report. I don't know if we have them or if they're ready. Uh, if not, why don't we start with the treasurer? And then, like I said, I want to keep, the, keep things moving. I did tell the chief that we'll be ready by 7.15. So uh, let's start with our, our treasurer report. Hello everyone. This is, the, this is the treasurer's report from uh, the period of uh, January 10th, 2018 to February 13th, 2018. Our starting balance for that period was $1,409.42 uh, with a withdrawal, withdrawal for that period of $158.12 for the meal of the previous meal or of the meeting. Uh, and we have an ending balance of $1,251.30. So not a lot of transactions last month. Um, so I move that this would be accepted, or can I have someone move to accept? I have a Thank you. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Matt. Uh, with the minutes, uh, I, our uh, secretary has been out ill. So what we're going to do, we need to reconcile the minutes. We've actually had three people taking minutes during the course when she was ill. So we just want to agree on the motion to dispense with the minutes and at our next meeting, we'll do the minutes in bulk. Um, so moved. Second. Second, anyone opposed? So moved. Uh, next on uh, our agenda, so just a few announcements. So as many of you also know, I'm also chair of Ward 7 Democrats. Uh, on the 24th of February, we will have a forum uh, and possibly a debate uh, with Ed Lazier, who's running for um, city, city council. I'm sorry, I just blanked. My turn. Uh, council, city council chair, uh, and Chairman Mendelson. Uh, both will be at the meeting, so this should be an interesting venue. Uh, we're 501c3, so I kind of put these out here as general announcements and a caution to everyone that any announcements or reference to anything political it is simply an announcement and nothing more. And if you want to read something in between it, see me afterwards. No, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, so I tell you what we're going to do. I don't know if there's any other announcements. Uh, we forgot something important, so um, Lieutenant Jameson. Um, I don't know if you're nervous today or if you just want to be a little bit. That would happen. No, Lieutenant Jones. Sorry. Well, I'm going to be myself. <laughs> good evening. Um, crime, 4 for 605, is looking pretty good. Um, violent crime is down 17%. Uh, Property crime is down 4%. So a total crime decrease of uh, 6%. Uh, Go with the uh, crime stats. Uh, we got four ADWs, one in the 47 block of Alabama Avenue, one in the 29 block of Minnesota, 39 block of R Street, and the 3300 block of Minnesota. There was zero robberies for the last 30 days, one burglary, 29 block of Nelson Place. Uh, there were eight stolen autos, uh, 44 block of Alabama, 1300 block of Anacostia Road, 700 block of Burns, 
Thirty-four on the block of Pope. Thirteen on the block of Twenty Eighth Street. Twenty-eight on the block of Hill. Three thousand block of Feet. And the three thousand block of O. There were eleven car break-ins. Sixteen on the block of Fort Davis. Thirty-eight on the block of Alabama. Eight thousand. Correction. Eight on the block of Burns. Twenty-four on the block of Baker Lane. Sixteen on the block of Thirty-eight. Thirty-four on the block of N. Twenty-seven on the block of Minnesota Avenue. 21 on the block of Southern Avenue, 29 on the block of Old Street, 27 on the block of Fairline, and the 16 on the block of 40th Street. And there were only four thefts, and those usually double digits, so they weigh down. Any questions, comments, or concerns, or any issues I need to address? Um, I do. I know one neighbor, uh, Nelson Alvarado, um, wanted us to mention he had a package theft on his block. Uh, he said someone um, actually took the package, opened it up took the belongings out and left them. Um, so my, I did talk to him about the security cameras, uh, but I promised them that since they put it on the listserv that I would raise it during this meeting. What was his block? It is the, what's the under the carpenter? 35, 3400 block of carpenter street. And I think it just happened yesterday or Sunday. Oh, that's why I was here. Yeah, you would have had that. Did he report that? Um, I encourage them to do that and get security cameras. Okay, okay great. I'll check in for you. Anything else? Um, just continue to um, like it where the park is. We talked about it before. Sure. Where they have dumped a couple of stolen like cars before. Right. And I, just... I personally went down there myself. Mm -hmm. if, if anything y'all tell me, I go personally inspect myself, so I have to be the first hand knowledge of you know, But they're gone there. now, so yeah. I guess you got to move or whatever you did. But well, you just. Um, but just know that that they do steal cars and they don't do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Anybody else? So what's the, the recommendation so that we, although we are having this increases in us up and down on the thefts, cars, homes, and whatever, uh -huh. what are some of the other recommendations that uh, For stolen cars? Can you give us way no anything. I know they may patrol or we may see the police car every so often come through. Uh -huh. Or any other well, yeah, I have a, I don't know if I put it back in. I have a package of stuff here on the back, and I'll put it on the table that, you know, some crime or and tips. Usually what I do is, uh, if we have an increase in spike in crime, whatever that specific crime is, I attach some tips. For example, like stolen autos, you might want to use a club. I use a club. I park in the garage, and I use a club in my garage. So, you know, um, not about the fair practice. Um, you know, don't leave stuff in your car so people can come in and break through, especially during the holidays. I'm just saying that. You know, like practices like that, you know, you pull up in front of your house and something don't look right, just drive by and down 911 and we'll come check it out. You know, stuff like that. Um, don't leave your car running in the winter time. That happens a lot. You know, people leave their money on the front seat and come break in. I mean, sometimes we got to protect ourselves. So, stuff like that we can do to help protect us and not be a victim, pretty much. You know, parking well in the areas and also your homes, make sure they kind of got lights too, because I know I go up and down Carpenter Street and 38, it's really dark up in there. I can barely see your addresses, and you as the homeowners, I can, you know, so we can come find you, you know, put a light on your, on your address so we know where you're at, in the event that you need us. Okay. Anything else? Anything, Jimmy? Uh, you don't want to ask me how I always come up with something. No, <laughs> um, um, you know, I, I think that's it. We'll continue to email everything. And okay. Always thank you for the great work. I really, we should be giving him a hand because he's been here always. Okay, and the only other announcement I have before that, a lot of people are still asking about Penn Branch Shopping Center and what's happening with Penn Branch. Um, there's a couple things that we, you'll find of interest. They've already started on the Planet Hollywood um, with Penn Branch, so that's already there. Um, so that's, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> Please, not wow. Planet Hollywood. Planet Fitness, thank you very much. Um, so they've already started on the Planet, planet Fitness. Uh, that started. Um, and the rest of the uh, development of, uh, there will start uh, through March. So um, they'll be working on the development uh, upstairs and redoing that whole front through March. The other part of the zoning area, that's still in discussion. But I do tell you this, that you'll have an announcement of a couple of meetings and a tour that we'll be doing as a group. The whole objective is as a community. We've been divided as a community on what should be there. But the one thing we want to do is be sensitive uh, to what's impacting our neighbors. So we did meet through during our last executive board. We agreed on a couple of things. We will tour the entire Old Street area. 
the entire area surrounding about that, and then we'll be following up with a small meeting with key stakeholders, and that will be followed up uh, with a secondary meeting with the developers and most likely the Ward 7 uh, people from Ward 7 City Council. So we want to elevate it, but the first thing we want to do is make sure that as a community we're one on this agreement, that any divisions we have are addressed. Uh, but we also want to look at every complaint and every concern, uh, anticipate what's happening, but we want to be in a room so that we never have to repeat what we did again where we had the neighborhood split over a development that we both want. And the question is, what road do we take to get there? So stay tuned to the email, we, uh, email and listserv. Uh, we'll be following up. But then again, this meeting will happen in real, fairly short term. And again, it's the time for us to all end up on the same page and face realities, but also get on the same page and be sensitive to what's happening. So I'll keep you posted to that. So with that, I'll bring on our Vice President, Lori Ward. All right, good evening. So one of the things we pride ourselves on at Penn Branch is being a working class neighborhood. We have uh, a lot of current public safety uh, professionals in our neighborhood. We have active and retired firefighters, police officers, teachers, DC government workers, and with that, we have a great work relationship with Metropolitan Police Department. Um, I see one retiree over here, Mr. Bruton, retired. What year, Mr. Bruton? Pardon me? What year did you retire? Uh, I, I was a policeman from 1964 to 1984, 20 years to the day. Right. Wow. Oh. So we wanted to. Chief Newsham come out and speak to us and uh, sent an email to his office and they were very quick to get back with us and say he would love to come out. Um, so we set up the meeting for tonight and we're uh, very excited. So I'll go over a quick bio. Uh, Chief Newsham joined MPD in 1989 and rose quickly through the ranks, serving in a number of district operation assignments. Chief Ramsey promoted him to commander of the second district in January of 2000. In January of 2002, Chief Newsham was promoted to Assistant Chief in charge of Officer Professional Responsibility, which included the Internal Affairs Division, Civil Rights, and Force Investigation Division and Compliance Monitoring Team, which was responsible for overseeing MPD's Memorandum of Agreement with the U.S. Department of Justice. Chief Newsham took, took the position of Assistant Chief in charge of, of Rock North in July of 2004. In September 23rd, on September 23rd, 2007, Chief Lanier announced a reorganization to the Metropolitan Police Department and put Chief Newsham in charge of the Internal Affairs Bureau. In 2009, Assistant Chief Newsham was named the Assistant Chief of the Investigative Service Bureau. Mayor Bowser appointed Chief Newsham as Interim Chief on September 15th of 2016. He was named Chief of the Metropolitan Police Department on February 23rd, 2017 and sworn in on May 2nd, 2017. Chief Newsham holds a bachelor's degree from the College of Holy Cross and a law degree from the University of Maryland Law School. He's also a member of the Maryland Bar. So, Chief Newsham. Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. It's, um, whenever someone reads that bio, it makes me feel old. <laughs> but thank you, Mr. Broden, for being here because uh, you retired in 84 and I didn't come on until 89, so I think you got a couple years on right? <laughs> So the, the most important information, I think, uh, that's going to be given out tonight may have already been given out, uh, and tomorrow is Valentine's Day. So for those of you who have Valentine's, do not forget that tomorrow is Valentine's Day, or well, the rest of your year may not be as happy uh, if you forget your Valentine's. So, what I'm going to do is, in this presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about the state of crime in the District of Columbia, uh, where we are right now. Then I'm going to talk more specifically about what's going on in the 6th District, and then I'll get into the crime stats for this particular PSA. Then I'm going to show you a video of a crime that occurred not too far away from here, and I'm going to talk about what that video means uh, to us. And then I'll talk about a couple of things we're doing on the police department to try and service our community a little bit better. So if you look at this graph right here, this is a graph I like to show everybody whenever I speak around the city. That top line on that graph, that's the population in the District of Columbia from 2009 to 2017. And everybody can see that the population in the District of Columbia is increasing significantly, almost by 100,000 people. This month, uh, we will be at 700,000 residents who live in the District of Columbia. 
If you look at the middle of the graph, if you look at the red, what that is is calls for service for the Metropolitan Police Department. And as you might imagine, as our population has increased, so have our calls for service. The blue graph in the middle shows you the, the amount of time it takes the Metropolitan Police Department to respond to priority one calls for service. So even though our population has been increasing uh, and our calls for service have been increasing, at MPD we've actually been able to respond quicker to priority one calls for service during that same time frame. And people will normally ask, well, how the heck were we able to do that? Uh, we have uh, realized a number of efficiencies in what we do. We have actually some of the work that the Metropolitan Police Department used to do, we don't do anymore. A couple of examples of that is the Department of Forensic Sciences has been established in that time frame. The Department of Forensic Sciences actually is uh, mostly is the people who come out and collect evidence from our crime scene. So we don't have police officers doing that work anymore. Uh, another thing is the processing and the, and the hospital details for prisoners, that has been taken over by the Department of Corrections. So no longer do you have MPD police officers, we can put our police officers out on the street as opposed to be guarding prisoners. Uh, the other thing that we've been able to do over those years is we've been able to significantly improve our IT capabilities. And what that does, it allows our police officers to be able to process the paperwork that they have to do, whether it be with an arrest, reports, uh, traffic crashes, in a much quicker fashion. And that enables your police officers to do the work and to get back out into the community where they belong, servicing uh, the folks who, who live and work in our city. That last graph at the bottom, and that's the one I think is the most important, that is reported violent crime in our city, city for that same time frame. And you can see that we have had significant reductions in reported violent crime in our city. You can go to the next slide. If you look at, this is uh, the 6th district, and this is, uh, the, it will be similar with regards to the reductions that we've seen in crime. This is 2017 compared to 2016 for the year. Uh, so you've had significant reductions, particularly in violent crime. The two categories of crime that have uh, been kind of a chronic problem here is your uh, theft from auto and your thefts. And some of that can be attributed to the fact that our population has increased in the city, but it also means that your police department probably has to do a little bit better job on those two crimes. The other thing I will point out about this slide, which is really important, because people ask me all the time, how were we able to drive down violent crime the way that we were uh, in recent years? And two of the things that we have focused on is we have focused on uh, seizing illegal firearms from our community, we have focused on robberies in our community, and we have focused on burglaries in our community, and we have focused on repeat violent offenders. And let me tell you why we chose those things uh, to focus on. Uh, robberies and burglaries, if you look at the numbers up there, those are the biggest numbers that you're going to see on the, on the, uh, in violent crime uh, on that graph. Aside from thefts and theft from autos, that's the largest category of crime. The other thing about robberies and burglaries is that robberies and burglaries are a random crime. That is the crime I think that most folks in the community are most fearful that they could potentially be the victim of. When a robber or a burglar decides that they're going to rob someone or burglarize their house, they don't care who it is. A lot of the times when you look up there in the homicide category, not all the time, or if you look in our assault category, the suspect and the victim frequently know each other. So it's not random like those other crimes. So what we did around robberies is that we developed a, a robbery intervention task force back in December of uh, 2015. And what that task force does is it focuses on pattern robberies in our city. What a pattern robbery is, is we have one person or a group of person that will commit a robbery, and guess what up? They'll go out and do, do another one, and then they'll do another one, and they'll do another one. And we had that happen in our city far too often. So what our Crime Information Center does is when a pattern starts to emerge in our city, we immediately, immediately move resources over into that area. We have to do that with regards to robberies because robberies are an extremely difficult case to close. If you don't catch the person in the act, it's very difficult, and I'll tell you why, because the victim of a robbery is, has to be able to identify the suspect, and it's very difficult to identify a suspect in a robbery because robberies happen so fast 
And generally, if you're the victim of the robbery, the, the emotion that you feel is fear. And so the last thing in the world you're thinking about is looking at the person and being able to uh, remember what that person looks like. So it's really important that we get police in the area and try and make that, uh, make that case. The other thing uh, with robberies is that it's very infrequent that a robber will leave any forensics on the scene of the robbery. They will come, they will do what they got to do, they will take the property and they will go. You know, a lot of other crimes, burglaries, uh, assaults, homicides, there's forensic evidence left on the scene that can lead us back to the criminal. You don't get that in robberies. The other thing we did with the Robbery Intervention Task Force is we actually have an MPD officer that sits in the Metro Command uh, for the Metro system. And what that does is it gives us the ability to look at all of the Metro cameras across the city. We have Metro cameras on all of our buses and all of our, uh, our uh, underground Metro systems. What that officer can do or that investigator can do is if a robbery occurs and, it, and somebody uses the Metro as an escape route, they can get images of that suspect and get it out to our officers in the field in very short time. And that gives us the ability to close those cases much quicker. The last thing I'll say about robberies is we have uh, the Office of the Attorney General and the U.S. Attorney's Office on board uh, for prosecution of these cases to make sure that we have solid prosecution. So if something happens down at papering and they need additional information, can my investigators who are in the room raise your hand? These folks right here will make sure that they have the information they need so people who are uh, involved in these robberies are held responsible. I talked about getting illegal guns out of our community. We have way too many illegal firearms in our community. And when you look at some of the most violent things that we see in our city, every single one of those situations is associated with a firearm. We have had, um, we used to look at, uh, we still do, we look at the motives associated with the violence in our community. Like I said, I joined the police department in 1989. Back in those days, the number one motive for our shootings and our homicides was the crack epidemic. It was turf wars and it was, it was disputes over that, that, that drug, I'll just call it a drug. Uh, it was killing our community. Uh, most recently, in recent years, the number one motive in our shootings and in our homicides is petty disputes. So we have moved from having turf wars where people are fighting over drug areas to a situation where people are having petty disputes, somebody's pulling out a firearm, the next thing you know, somebody's dead. So two people's lives are destroyed. The person who ends up getting shot and killed, their family is destroyed, their community is upset, the person who pulled the trigger, because we have a very good homicide unit. Uh, they have, they've averaged about a 70% closure rate. If you commit a, a homicide in this city, you're probably going to be held responsible for that. Um, we can go to the next slide. So this will give you a, a snapshot uh, of where we are. I can't read my headings on this. Uh, that's police service area 605. This is 605. And this is uh, 2016 compared to 2017. Uh, so you can look at the, where we are. The violent crime uh, is, is, is down for the city. And if you look at the other numbers, burglaries were down pretty significantly. Uh, motor vehicle theft. So, most, uh, so this just gives you a snapshot uh, of what Lieutenant Jameson was talking about. You can go to the next slide. I think this is so far this year uh, for what we had. And so a couple things when you look at this graph that you might be a little concerned about. Uh, we did have a homicide that happened in the 4700 block of Alabama Avenue. It was a shooting that had happened earlier in the year, and the, the, the young man that was killed in that case, um, he just died a couple of days ago. That ends up being one of our homicides. And if you look at our assaults with a dangerous weapon, uh, we have five. Uh, three of those five were domestic violence cases. Uh, four of those five are closed cases, which means we have already arrested somebody and held them responsible for it. And the fifth case, there is a warrant. So I, I tell you that to say that in those five cases, we were able to identify the suspect, uh, and they didn't appear to be random in nature, most of the assaults that have happened in your community. Uh, Jameson was very happy to point out you have not had any robberies so far this year. We're happy about that, too. We'd like to keep it that way. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So I'm going to show you this video real quick, and then I'm going to talk about it. Go ahead and uh, show the video. Here.
So apparently they didn't know how to start the car. So, but what we do, and, and the reason I show you this video is what we do with all of the serious crimes that happen in our community is that we, we, we create, if there's video available, we create a video like this and we put it online. Sometimes I think that our community becomes immune to this stuff because we put a lot of that stuff out and they stop looking at that stuff. I can tell you that the uh, advent of uh, video in our communities has probably been the number one thing uh, that has assisted law enforcement in closing cases. And so one of the things I always urge the public to do, as difficult as it may be, is when this stuff does come out, particularly when it occurs in your community, try to urge people to put their eyes on it. Because, you know, that's not the best video in the world, but somebody may notice the clothing that those folks were wearing. Uh, somebody may notice something that we may not see in law enforcement that stands out about those particular individuals. That can be the tip that helps us close this case. And this is, this is a very dangerous situation right here. Nobody was injured in this particular case, but you saw a gun was drawn. All you need is an accident. All you would need is a victim who tries to fight back and we could have another young person who would lose their life in their community. So the two things I would say about this, if when these images do come out, please urge folks to look at it. Uh, and the second thing is, if you do not have, or if you have not taken advantage of the camera rebate program uh, that the mayor's office has established, you should do that. Because that has been extremely helpful to us in closing crimes uh, in our communities throughout the city. You can go to the next slide. Dash cams are mainly Oh, this is, uh, you know, people frequently ask us about the training that we have on the Metropolitan Police Department. This is something that we're very proud of. Uh, the National Museum of African American History, uh, the, uh, the, what are the schools? Georgetown University and UDC have partnered with us to allow, to allow all of our police officers to go through this pro program at the National Museum of African American History. And what it is trying to do it's trying to have our officers be more culturally sensitive to the experience that African Americans have had in Washington, D.C. Uh, I have had the opportunity to go to the museum twice. Is anyone in here? Raise your hands if you had a chance to go. Isn't it probably the most amazing thing you've ever done in your life? It, it's an incredible experience. And what I tell my officers who go through this program is that if you go through that, that uh, museum, uh, police officers in our community were responsible for some of the things that happened in our history not too long ago. The racism, holding people down, that was being done by police officers. And I tell them that so they have the realization to know that sometimes when they go into communities, they have to prove that we are not like the police officers from back then, the police officers who were doing those things. That's the message we're trying to get into the mind of every one of our police officers. We're very fortunate that the museum is here in Washington, D.C. We're very fortunate that UDC and Georgetown has partnered with us to run our officers through this program. So we're very pleased about this. You can go to the next slide. Uh, I don't know if it impacts anyone in here. One of the things we're always trying to do on the police department is find another mechanism of communicating with our community. So we have established an ANC newsletter. There are about 220 or so uh, ANC uh, commissioners around the city. Uh, every quarter we send out this newsletter. It gives a bunch of information about our police department, about crime, about things that want to know. And then the last thing that I want to show you is this. Now, are there any reporters in the room? You know, if you were a reporter, you wouldn't raise your hand. But you should know we are going to be in the court. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But anyways, um, what's going to be coming out uh, in the not too distant future, probably within the next week to 10 days, is what's called crime cards. And what this is, it gives uh, people who live in our community, we already have a crime mapping system, but it's become a little dated. This is going to update that. 
you will, if you're interested in the note about crime in your community, this, this system right here is going to be ideal for that thing. It can also be uh, put on your uh, mobile devices. You can go on the mobile device and you can actually put me in there, one of the, and then like do like a thousand foot circle, and it will get your GPS coordinates and it can tell you about any crime if it's in the area where you actually are standing at that moment. So it's pretty, pretty improved technology that we're going to be rolling out uh, in the very near future. The idea behind this is to give people as much information that they need to have with regards to crime. So with all that being said, uh, I can take any questions that you all have. Yes, ma'am. I have actually uh, two questions. I know you saw the slides. You don't have to go back to it. The sexual assaults have increased. Are they random? Are they school age? Or what were these assaults occur? That's a great question. The large majority of our sexual assaults that occur in the city uh, the victim and the stranger know each other. So that's the large majority. Of them. And the majority of those cases we're able to bring over to the U.S. Attorney's Office for prosecution. If there is a case involving a stranger, that is something that we would put out by way of a press release to let the community know right away. So if something, if there's a stranger sexual assault that occurs in your neighborhood, you should hear about it from us. And the other question, although I want to thank you for coming, I'm really glad you're here. Um, just, um, I did a couple of FOIA requests on three incidences that had happened, and one is as if it didn't happen or didn't exist, and I was concerned the little boy that was riding his bike through the alley, and they said the police car had rammed his bike. Right, and that was up in the 4th District, right? Okay, yeah, it said they bent his wheel. I never heard anything about that, and the incident that happened on 7th and T where the policeman had jacked up this little lady and held right. her dangling by her feet, nothing was said about that. And the last one where this policeman was um, had come up to these gentlemen sitting at their neighborhood, having a little party or whatever, but the way he followed the fella and grabbed him by his... I know all three incidents that you're talking about. Yeah, I was yeah. so hurt when I saw that. I had to right. cry when I saw it, but <laughs> I didn't hear any follow-ups on what... So, so let, me, let me tell you about things like that. When things like that happen, uh, the people that are standing in this room right now are, are just upset about those things as you are. Uh, we don't like to see our officers that are, that are behaving in that way, uh, particularly when that stuff is put out and, and everybody sees it, because everyone is going to associate that behavior with everybody who puts on this uniform, and it's just not true. If you've had a hard time getting information on those cases, normally you cannot get that information right away because there are personnel rule, rules that protect uh, the officers that are involved. But after a period of time goes by, that information does become available. And if you want to get that information, if you give me your contact information, we'll make sure that you get it. we got nothing to hide in those cases. So those are great questions. Oh, and everyone, please identify yourself when you speak to us. Go ahead, sir. Thank you very much for coming. I'm Kevin Brown, 3900 Block, Pennsylvania. Just curious what the correct response is when we hear an assault riot. Call, please. Uh, I mean, yeah, 911, you call the police. And, and that's, a, that's a great question because people ask me all the time. People have a lot of different ways of communicating with their officers nowadays. Uh, sometimes we have an officer we know, we have their text. Uh, sometimes we're emailing folks. If, if you need the police and you hear something urgent like that, call the police. Because we will come out, we will take a report. We track all the gunshots that occur in the city. So we'll, And the other thing, too, i got to tell you about is uh, whenever a gun is fired in the city, if they leave shell casings there, we actually have a uh, criminal gun intelligence center. We put those shell casings into a, a computer program, which is called NIBIN, and you can match up where those shell casings were if it was fired anywhere else in the city or even in Prince George's County. And what that does for us, it gives us investigative leads. We may not get any information from the shell casings we recover, you know, from the gunshots you call in, but later on, we may be able to tie that to another case where there is an arrest, and then we can go back because the shell cases were there and potentially make a case there. It, it, everyone around me says that we have things in our buildings that can geolocate the shots. Is that we do? We have shot spotter in the city. It's not. It doesn't encompass the entire city, but the large majority of the city is, co is covered, what, uh, uh, covered by what's called shot spotter, yeah. and that's exactly what it does. It takes the sound and it triangulates it, and it gives us a pretty good idea of where that occurs. But the more information that we get uh, in those circumstances, the better. For example, shot spotter doesn't tell us if a car just sped off. You know, a shot spotter doesn't tell us if somebody was screaming in apartment 301 
And that's the type of information that we urge our community to give us that they do hear gunshots. So, go ahead. Uh, Anthony Diallo, a resident and uh, community, out community outreach specialist for DCRA. Uh, first of all, uh, Chief, I wanted to say thank you for the, for the work that you have done uh, while, while as Chief. Uh, it's noticeable and I hope you continue it. Uh, but I have two quick questions. One uh, in, in regards to the video. Uh, could you, could you uh, explain to us what's the difference between burglaries and property, property value? Or? Property crime versus Pro violent crime. Yeah. So, so the designation of violent crime versus property crime is generally, and this is very general, whether or not the crime is committed against a person. So that's where your violent crimes are listed on the top. That's a designation that's done by the FBI. A burglary is considered a property crime. It, it happens in the home and it's very disturbing, uh, but nobody's usually home at the time that it occurs. So that, that's the different designation. Okay, and, then, and my last question is, uh, I understand there are cameras uh, near, near uh, street lights or certain designated public spaces. Uh, where are those cameras and how often do those cameras help to solve crimes? You talk about the cameras that we own? Yes. That, so we do have a number of MPD cameras throughout the city. Those were designated but based off a crime, you know, doing a crime analysis to determine the, the areas where we feel that they're uh, going to be most valuable. We get information from those cameras from time to time. Uh, there is so much other video out there in our community. Uh, cell phones, uh, privately owned videos, uh, DDOT cameras, uh, red light cameras, that, and, and we search all that information if a crime occurs in a particular area. So we do have cameras out there, but we do, uh, the police department could no way uh, have enough money to have cameras in every single neighborhood. Uh, so we try and put them in the areas where we think they're going to be the most valuable. Uh, but we still get video from a host of other places. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, then I'll come to you. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, uh, 3716 Carpenter. <coughs> Chief, can you give me um, your opinion of the concealed carry? I can, yes. Uh, so the concealed carry uh, situation right now here in the District of Columbia has recently changed. We used to require that you uh, have a good cause uh, for carrying a, uh, have, getting a carry permit in the District of Columbia. Now there is no longer a requirement for a good cause. So if you can pass a criminal background check, uh, if you do not have a history of uh, 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 drug or alcohol abuse, uh, if you do not have a history of domestic violence and you are of sound mind, you can apply for a, a carry permit in the District of Columbia. So that's the state of affairs right now. Uh, compared to a population of 700,000, we do not have that many people that are actually requesting carry permits in the district. I forget exactly what the number is, but it's around, I think we've had around 800 people who have submitted applications. Uh, half of the people who have requested carry permits in the District of Columbia don't even live in the District of Columbia. So. Yes, I, I told her I would go, and then I'll come over there again. Um. There's a lot of drag racing coming down Pennsylvania Avenue, and I see them three or four times a day coming down straight down Pennsylvania Avenue. There be drag racing in cars. Uh, what time of day is that? Around two. One day it started two o'clock. Is two a.m. Two p.m. Oh, two p.m. In the afternoon. So, what in a situation like that? Do they have cameras set up for the speed? What, what, what's your camera situation, David? Yeah, we have several speed cameras on Pennsylvania. Is that centered? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Of course. Yeah. We have several yeah, cameras. <laughs> 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 we have several cameras on uh, Pennsylvania Avenue. I, 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 first, yeah, I brought back up. <laughs> <laughs> it is the first I've heard of that. Uh, I'll follow with you in a little bit. Okay, yeah. Okay. All right, but, but in all seriousness, I have heard about the concerns about uh, people particularly driving through the neighborhoods. Uh, and, and we do have, a, I understand, we have some officers that are aggressively trying to ticket folks to prevent them from doing it. I mean, you all know you live here. Pennsylvania Ave is a main artery. That thing stays busy. Uh, we could write tickets all the live long day, and I think we're still going to have some people that are going to drive through our community. So we will do the best that we can on our end to prevent it. Uh, we're not going to tolerate it. I know it's disruptive. Uh, and if you find a situation where we don't have officers out there trying to work on this thing, you can let me know and we'll 
try and get some resources for her. Okay. She had her hand up, and then I'll come up here. And I'll say something to you. Okay. No, go ahead. Oh, um, Chief, what is your policy on fireworks? I think I've called the police 50 million times about, and July will be coming up soon, about firecrackers. I don't mean the little ones for the kids. I mean uh -huh. the big ones that are not only damaging property, but they are not safe. Yeah, I, I mean, our policy is if we get them, we're going to take them. I mean, that's, it's, it's pretty simple as that. You're not supposed to have anything in the District of Columbia that explodes. Uh, and we can identify that stuff pretty readily. Uh, we go out week, 10 days, uh, even two weeks before the 4th of July, and we have our officers aggressively going out there to try and seize fireworks. Um, i got to be honest with you, it doesn't seem to have much of an impact. Uh, there are a lot of people out there in the community that feel that fireworks is not something um, that should be illegal, uh, even though it is. Uh, and it, it's, it's, a, it's a tough situation for us, for us to get to. Do you want to add yeah, um, I chime in as a young person, as a millennial in the room. Most people, I'll say 99% of people, do not know that fireworks are illegal in Washington. They so don't if anything, that. they think that they're legal. And I know people my age who will get four or five people and they will drive to Pennsylvania. And because they know they can make money out of it, they will go buy, you know, half sticks of dynamite. Uh, you know, very, you can go to Pennsylvania, you can get very, very, very powerful fireworks. Um, and South Carolina. Or North Carolina, South Carolina. So, a lot so of we need to probably do, do a better job of doing a, a public uh, information campaign around it. So for the people who are, are going to obey the law, we can, we can impact those people, hopefully. You know, it, it creates a problem for us, too, because it's sometimes difficult to, to distinguish between those fireworks in here. Some of them are pretty, pretty loud. And gunshots. So we don't know, you know what I mean? It puts us in a very precarious position too. So we're not, you know, we're not, we're, we're not going to tolerate. We're going to do everything we can to intercede on it. We will be out there again uh, prior to the Fourth of July, trying to seize them. Uh, and I will talk to the powers that be, see if we can't do a better job of advertising, maybe to those young people that it is illegal. In the so that's a good question. It's a tough question. And I, I want to add, these people are not from DC. They're from Prince George. Because I don't think Prince George's allowed that. Mm -hmm. No, I don't. I think it's pretty bad in PG too. Yeah, it's it's bad over over there. Because I've been over there when it's going on. It, it, Fourth of July is. Uh, it's well, you didn't come to my house because I have called the police. I will come to your house. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to call the police. I will come to your house. And I am out there every Fourth of July trying to make my way around. <laughs> First of all, before you ask your question, I want to say thank you for what you do. You're a principal uh, at one of our schools, and that is uh, God's work. What you do. Thank you. Um, a couple things. Uh, my husband's a juvenile um, probation officer in D.C. You didn't talk about sex trafficking. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's not a new sex trafficking war. So can you talk about the issue around sex trafficking that's going on in the city? Second off, do we still have job outs that are no longer from policy? And then third of all, the city can make a lot of money if they just park somebody at the 3200. Man, knows because I call them. If they just park somebody every day, they would get 100 cars coming through O Street. And they could write tickets and make a lot of money. Um, so just want you to know, it could be a big goal for business because they come through there starting at 6 in the morning, flying, flying, yep. And I've sent pictures, videos, off. Commander Taylor, what I call, he wants to make sure somebody comes, but I'm just saying, for my investment of money, you can make a lot of money there. <laughs> All right, so on, on the human trafficking, that's, um, that's a very, very serious issue. You can see uh, where it's happening in communities all over the country. Uh, Washington, D.C. is no different. Uh, one of the things that we did do uh, in December of last year uh, was that we changed our policy around our, our missing kids uh, because our missing kids are probably the most vulnerable to predators in our community. And so what uh, we uh, I appointed a new commander, uh, Commander Dickerson, to our Youth and Family Services Division. And what she did is we used to only uh, put out uh, by way of social media and by PIO uh, uh, information when a kid was missing and we thought they were in jeopardy. And now we've changed that philosophy because even if a kid has been missing several times or they're a chronic runaway, 
Whenever that kid is away from adult supervision, that kid is in jeopardy. And so what we do is every time we have a missing kid in the city, we put that out on social media. It got a lot of attention when we first did that. I don't know if you all remember that. And we, some people were critical of us. They're like, oh my God, all these kids are going missing. It was no different uh, than it ever had been. Uh, but that's one of the ways that we're working to make sure that our young people in particular are protected. We also do a lot of investigative things with regards to human trafficking. We have a unit over at Narcotics and Special Investigations Division that particularly focuses on uh, 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 people who could potentially be uh, victims of human trafficking. Uh, so we are we're, we're acutely aware of the problem. Uh, with regards to the missing kids, we're very successful uh, at getting our kids back. And, getting, and that uh, be, being able to put that stuff out on social media has been very effective. So our kids are not going and disappearing for as long as they used to. Uh, so that's one of the things we're doing there. With regards to the jump outs, I think you probably remember this, that there was a lot of concern about jump outs in our community across the city. Uh, that tactic was associated with our vice units. We eliminated our vi vice units. All of our plainclothes operations now work out of our narcotics and special investigations division. Before we allowed our plainclothes units to go out into the street, we retrained them and we told them what was what was and what 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 was not allowable. And the fact that uh, they were uh, there was an allegation that our, the jump outs were uh, were indiscriminately jumping out on folks and violating people's civil rights. Metropolitan Police Department doesn't want to be associated with that in any way, shape, or form. And so we have professionalized what we do with uh, regards to plain clothes operation. I've taken a lot of heat from that in some other communities, because in some other communities they say, we want the jump outs, and I'm like, we're not going to do that because it makes us look bad. And anything that makes us look bad, I don't think we should be doing. The other thing that we're doing with our, um, our plain clothes units, particularly our drug units, is we've shifted our focus away from people who use drugs to people who are distributing drugs. And if you look at our statistics, the arrests for drug distribution have increased significantly, where possession has decreased. We still arrest people for possession of drugs. And the reason behind that is that somebody who is using drugs or just has possession of drugs is somebody who has a substance abuse issue. Uh, and locking them up and putting them in the criminal justice system doesn't change that behavior. Uh, you, have to, you have to treat that behavior, it has to be treated by professionals. And I know I'm going on really long about this, but it's important to us. So what uh, the mayor was able to give us a million dollars this year to develop a program with the Department of Behavioral Health. And what we're going to do in two pilot areas in the city is we're going to take those folks who might otherwise be arrested for because of their mental health circumstance or because of their substance abuse issues and we're going to try and divert those folks into DBH, the Department of Behavioral Health, so they get treatment as opposed to locking them up. You know, locking them up doesn't change the behavior. They're, when they go into jail, when they come out of jail, they're still going to have a substance abuse issue. So we're hopeful that if we can divert them into DBH, that that stuff can be appropriately treated and maybe we'll take somebody uh, who potentially could be arrested and, and have them live a life where they don't, they're not getting arrested. So that's, that's kind of a long-term goal for us. In the back. Two questions. Do you think uh, with the, the new laws, marijuana laws, is that cause a drop in crime? And the other question is, you said with, in terms of crime, violent crimes, and other crimes that you all look at a community, but what about looking at the individual and tracking the individual? I think in Chicago, they have a system where they're tracking the individual who commit crimes time after time. They have a team approach, so yeah. I don't know if that's something that... Yeah, the, the, you know, uh, this is the thing uh, with violent offenders, and I tell communities of this all the time. The violent offenders that are in the District of Columbia are a very small group of people. Uh, they really are. Uh, and I think that our criminal justice system probably needs to do a better job of focusing on those violent offenders. Uh, we know who they are. Uh, we deal with them on a regular basis. Uh, frequently, we are arresting them over and over again. Uh, they enter the criminal justice system. Uh, and remember, um, just keep in mind, these are violent offenders. Uh, and sometimes what I ask communities to do is uh, pay close attention when violent offenders enter into the criminal justice system. People think once an arrest is made, that's the end. When an arrest is made, it's really just the beginning. I live in the District of Columbia. 
I can tell you this, some of the violent offenders that have received sentences in our city, I am not comfortable with. I'm not telling you to feel the way that I do, but I'm telling you to pay attention. And if you don't feel comfortable with it, let somebody know about it. Because your voice is going to carry way further than mine with regards to this. I can't stand seeing a violent offender be arrested for a violent crime to come out and reoffend uh, because they haven't been appropriately dealt with. That is what probably keeps me up most at night, to see that kind of thing happen in our community. And like I said, it's only a small group of people. It really is. So, does that answer your question? So, so you said that you may look, start tracking the individuals or seeing how they're sick and how, what happens when they come out? Is that what you're saying? We, we pay very careful attention to our violent offenders. Uh, we have a lot of programs that we know who we are. We have our summer crime initiative every summer where we're focused on our violent offenders. We have what's called gun stat where we're focused on the most the folks that we think are the most violent in the city. So we do follow them very closely. And the other question with the marijuana laws, have they changed? Have they called the drop-in, drop -in? Oh, marijuana. Um, you know, uh, marijuana is kind of a tough one. So. Uh, marijuana has caused a lot of problems in our community. Uh, the, the, there are people that think that marijuana uh, smoking or possession should be legal, and it is legal in the District of Columbia. You can have up to two ounces of marijuana. Um, but there are people in our community that, that are just uh, kind of sick and tired of having folks smoke marijuana in public places. And so the authority that we have right now, if you are publicly smoking marijuana, you can be placed under arrest. Uh, for a police officer to catch somebody publicly smoking, a little bit more difficult. You know, it's very easy to, to put it out before the police officer gets there. But you can smell it. I know you can smell yeah. it, but if you look at if you look at the law, the law actually says that we cannot use the smell of marijuana as grounds for a stop. Oh, that's ridiculous. That that was specifically put into law. I think that. Can I say this without getting in trouble? Uh, is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. But that is in the law. That is the state of affairs in the District of Columbia. So that might be something that you want to talk about with our council. And like, why did we do that? So we've kind of, we've kind of taken all of the ability to enforce this away from the police. And it's a nuisance. If you live in a multi-story building and somebody is smoking marijuana on the second floor, and guess what? Third floor, fourth floor, fifth floor, they're all being impacted by this. Uh, so, so maybe some thought, and this is just you know, Chief Newsham talking. I'm not telling you which way to think, because you said you can't be political in here. But <laughs> but you, so maybe some, some tweaks need to be made to that law to give police the authority to, to get a, to address those nuisance situations where people are people's I mean their lives are being impacted by. Yeah, you, know, you walk into a CVS, you're afraid to walk into a CVS or a store because there's three or four guys out front and all you can smell is marijuana. You know, it's, I don't know. I, I, I just, I don't have a lot of tolerance for that. But has crime dropped because of that new law? Has crime dropped because of the marijuana law? I don't think I could attribute the drop in crime to, to, um, to the marijuana laws. Arrest for possession is down. Arrest for uh, public uh, smoking is up. I think I think one resident um brought it to my attention that I think they're concerned with marijuana smoking is that you know it's one thing for the adults, uh, but I think for most of the concerns that are brought in here that juveniles are uh, the ones who are you know falling victim to it. Um, and they were getting arrested for possession, which opens the door and starts that cycle. Um, of incarceration for something minor, and, and I think it's an edu I, for me myself. I think it's more of an education gap. Um, I think that the law is fine, and you know that an adult should be able to do whatever they want. Um, and there were times where you know uh, certain individuals were adversely impacted by the law, but I think there hasn't been enough education around informing adults and spe specifically school children around what you know what, what's going on with marijuana, how it affects you. Um, and I think particularly for athletes, you know, a lot of young people, they box, they play football. D.C. has one of the highest rates of uh, young athletes going into the NCAA to come out of this area for basketball and football. But a lot of these young guys in playing football and basketball now, all they worry about is smoking weed and they want to be rappers. You know, so 
I think if we wanted to really curb this, I think an education campaign for the um, kids, that's probably on the juvenile yeah. level would definitely have a significance. And then I guess some responsibility from adults just to be more accountable um, and, and, and set a better example because 30 year old, 40 year old grown men standing on Nail Road, you know, s smoking big blunts isn't a, a, a good idea when you have an elementary school a block away or a high school that's three blocks away. So. I absolutely agree. Absolutely. Just, uh, just a quick last um, comment. Wait, hold on. I'm sorry. I think Matt in the back had a question first. Sorry, Matt. I was just curious if there's any plans to change your approach to the ATVs or any. We have actually, I know you might find this hard to believe, but we have had some success with the way we've been enforcing the ATVs. People in our community get very upset uh, when these large groups of riders get together and drive through our community. I have come out publicly a couple of times and say, and said they're terrorizing our community. And these are largely adult men. These aren't juveniles. They're getting out there. Frequently, they don't even live in the District of Columbia. Uh, we have made a number of arrests. Uh, they're not from D.C. But what we do is we, we can't chase them, and the reason we can't chase them is because it's more dangerous. We don't want somebody to get killed because they're acting foolishly. So what we do is we actually got our helicopter up in the air, we actually get officers out of the area, we try to take images of them. If they stop at a particular location, we'll go in and we'll try and seize the ATVs. But again, we don't want to get into a chase uh, situation. Uh, last year, a couple of times, we put out to the public the images that we have taken because the images are very clear and we were able to follow up uh, with the office of the attorney general and get warrants for a number of those people to, to bring them in and hold them accountable and what it has done has and i'm keeping my fingers crossed because spring is coming but you used to see a lot larger groups out there now the groups are much smaller it hasn't stopped but you used to see 60 70 80 of them riding together now we're seeing groups of about 10 or 15. So we're going to continue doing what we're doing. We're going to go out there and try and take really good images of them. Here's again where I'm going to ask the community uh, to help us. If those images go out there and you put your eyes on those images and you see those, you can call us, you can leave your name. You don't even have to leave your name. You can call us anonymously, tell us who they are, and then we can hold these folks accountable and try and put a stop to them. So. What's the charge? Uh, it's operating a, a, what's it called? A, 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 a public space. A public space. Yeah. Uh, who's next? You were next, and then I'm going to come back. Well, mine is just quick. I noticed that we do have a lot of different type policemen in the district. I know the not Capitol Police, not Metropolitan Police, but uh, it, some are in uniform, and they, or you see the cars with the lights going, and I'm like, where are they coming from? You know, it's just a lot of different faces I see as policemen in the district, and I'd like to know if, how many, I know in Metropolitan, Maybe it's a lot majority live in the district. I'm not certain of that either. And I would like to think that if you're going to police the neighborhood, you should know your neighbors or know something. You know, so you can say, hey, Joe, just let's move on. Let's not, because it just looks bad when you see, of course, you're going to see so many on the ground, hands behind your back, and it's just not good. But if you knew, it's like, come on, Joe, let's move it along. Y'all don't have to I, I, I know agree. your community. Yeah, I agree that you need to know your community. And uh, just because you live in the district or don't live in the district shouldn't prohibit our officers from knowing the folks who live in the community. Uh, to answer your question, uh, most of our police officers do not live in the District of Columbia. I think only about 16%, is that right? 16% yeah. of our officers actually live in the district. Uh, one of the things that officers will tell you is they don't live in the district because they can't afford to live in the district. It's very expensive. Uh, it's becoming more and more expensive to live in the district. Of our officers. So we have done a couple of things to try and get um, the police department to have more of our officers live in the district. Uh, one of the things that the mayor put into our budget uh, for this fiscal year was for recruits that we're hiring, uh, it gives them $1,000 a month for six months uh, to, to uh, get a place in the city. Uh, and our idea behind that is if they come into the city and they live here for six months that they'll realize how wonderful our city is and they'll continue to live in our city, uh, which I, I think is probably going to work. Um, the other thing that we have is we have, uh, the city has a, uh, a program where they can give police officers some money for a down payment uh, to buy a home in the District of Columbia. And then the last thing that we have, and this is really great, is that the money was put into our 2018 budget to increase the number of cadets that we have. So we doubled the, the number of cadets that we have in the city. Cadets are young people up to the age of 24 
who live in the District of Columbia, and they can become a cadet. While they are a cadet, we pay for them to go to UDC to get their two years uh, of college education. And then if they want to do this, and we hope they will, they can matriculate into becoming a police officer. So, so it's a paid position. Uh, they get paid to go to school uh, to get their 60 college credits, and then they come, come become police officers. Right now, we have 70 cadets. Last year, at this time, we had about 35, so we've already been able to double that. That's, uh, and the other good news is half of our cadets are women. Uh, so, you know, if you look at the demographic of our police department, the demographic of our police department matches the city demographic in almost every single category except sex. Uh, we only have about 20% of our uh, police officers that are women. I'd like to see it be about 50%. So, go ahead. Pam, um, Abuse. Abuse? Abuse? Uh, when is abuse? Domestic abuse? Or? That's what I was talking about. So what's the question about that? Is it up or down in the district, domestic violence? We have, in a particular of uh, certain areas of our city, we have a significant problem with domestic violence. Uh, one of the programs that we have uh, in the district is we have what's called the Lethality Assessment Program. Mm -hmm. And what that does is we have advocates. If we have a, a victim of domestic violence, I think D.C. is pretty well situated to assist uh, our victims of domestic violence. There are a lot of advocates that provide resources uh, to people who are, are the victims of domestic violence. Our lethality assessment project, what we do is we'll, our advocates will actually uh, issue a questionnaire uh, to the victim, and the answers to that questionnaire can determine whether or not that victim uh, is in danger of being uh, killed or murdered. And so after they administer, and that tool has been scientifically established by really smart people, uh, after they establish that they think that the victim is, could potentially be uh, the victim of a homicide or a serious assault, they go over that information, they go over the tool uh, with the victim, and a lot of times that information alone is, is enough to convince the victim to move somewhere else to a safer place to live. So, so we take it very seriously. Uh, whether or not it's up or down uh, right now, I'd have to get back. Uh, with, uh, okay. okay, and I know um, just from our committee here, boys from the back, um, so we're very appreciative of you coming out. Um, there were some uh, questions we had that people emailed earlier, so there were two. Okay. Um, one of them was, um, we have a lot of people that have installed security cameras in the area. And, you know, we're fairly vigilant. Um, but the other thing is, the question was a very general question of what can we do as a community uh, working with MVD uh, in addition to the security cameras and other measures that we can do uh, that can not, not only help Penn Branch, which we think we do have a more than average crime, but also our surrounding communities. And you know, that, that's, uh, that's pretty simple. Uh, you got to do what you're doing right now. Uh, pay attention. Uh, I'm very impressed with the number of people that have taken the time uh, out of their evening to come in here and to listen uh, to concerns. Uh, really, uh, if we are all going to be successful as a community in reducing crime, uh, we got to know our neighbors. Uh, we got to look out for our neighbors when they're not home. Uh, we want our neighbors to do the same thing for us. Uh, really, when you talk about community policing, that's what that's what it's all about. Uh, if you have a police officer in your community and you don't know them, uh, I would urge you to get to know them. Uh, if they are a jerk, let me know. Uh, I will try to make them not be a jerk. Uh, police, officers, police officers are humans too, so they come with all different types of personalities. But really, it's that communication and that relationship amongst neighbors and amongst the police that I have seen has been the most effective thing in driving crime down in communities. If people are watching, uh, guess what? The criminals, the criminals know you're watching. And if they know if, uh, if you're not home, that your three neighbors are going to be watching your house, uh, they're going to find somewhere else to go. So that, that's what I would say. Okay, no, thank you. And the final question, I don't know if anyone else, uh, Laura, I saw you walk in the room. I didn't know if you had questions. Uh, and Laura heads our legal uh, legislative committee. Uh, and then the final question that we had, um, we talked a lot about traffic in the area, you know, speed cameras, lack of speed cameras. I know um, a lot of focus has been on Branch Avenue, 
Um, we know we get Branch Avenue on the other side of the hill crest, but on the corner of Branch and Pennsylvania Avenue, there's been a lot of questions about the traffic patterns over there, speeding cameras in that area because it's a hill. Um, that's one that I just want to bring you to your attention. And the second one is we have a lot of one-way streets, but the other kind of, uh, we have just the opposite is that a lot of people are concerned that they feel like they're stuck in their own neighborhood. So yeah. the average time if you're coming on Pennsylvania Avenue and you want to go downtown, um, you're going to lose a good 15 minutes uh, when you're on that block between Pennsylvania Avenue and Branch. So a lot of our own residents actually cut through some of those streets in addition to the people that we talked about from Maryland. I know people have raised that they're trying to get their children to Randall Island School. Uh, they've raised about going down O Street and trying to get there. And they're only traveling four blocks, but that four blocks takes a lot of time. I don't know the solution to that. I know one time, in one way we have these signs for a reason, but at the same time, some of our residents have also well, I think we've talked about some of the residents that feel like that they're actually trapped in their own neighborhoods. Uh, they don't want the traffic speeding through their neighborhoods, but they also feel like they have to always go around. So, don't know what the solution is. Next month we'll have um, DDOT. DDOT, yes. Yeah. So, uh, Jeff Marudian will be here. That's why I'm saying 3200 block will prevent a lot. We want to be able to move around our own neighborhood. Right. And sometimes, like even when I go to work out, trying to get back on my block. I'm afraid the police are going to pull me over and because of the all the um, do not turn in signs. So we're kind of trapped in our own neighborhood but yet we are inundated with other people. And that 3200 block of Oster where they turn right into passenger, if we could eliminate that, that starts the whole process of people coming through Is, here. is that a, a traffic pattern issue or is that an enforcement issue? It's probably some of both. Some of both? Yeah, I think we need a traffic study to figure out how to deal with this, I think but you're probably right. we need to cut off those main thoroughware where they is come this through. A, and is this a consensus the complaint? Community. Like, is yeah. this front, the whole neighborhood's yeah. complaint? So the last, yeah. the last, yeah. I realized yeah. 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 the time and the I lights I were to be readjusted in January. Um, so I didn't get out my then Jeff will be here the next month. Um, so so Jeff will be, so here's, so here's, here's what I can tell you on that, because Jeff knows a lot more about this than I do, engineering communities for the best flow of traffic. The circumstance that you have in your community may be the best situation, doesn't sound like it. Uh, he can tell you that. One of the things that we can do is if there's points where you need enforcement, we'll work with Jeff. To, to, if he says this is the place where you want to make sure that they're not doing this or they're not doing that. I think that, that combined effort. So when Jeff comes next month, uh, we'll make sure that we have we have representation here. We need to have a study of some kind of strategy behind it. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you all. If you're trying to take your child, some people are on both to the school safe plans and the They just want to drive down the street. Like, you can't do that kind of stuff because you might get pulled over. But yet, you're going to have all these other people riding in the neighborhood. So, have, have you been pulled over? Stuff. Have you been pulled over? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> you have? I have yeah. not had to show you where I was know that. Was it by a 6th District officer? Uh-huh. So they were out there doing their job. Right, they were out there. Like I said, he said, okay, where you driving? Wait, Cynthia, you don't drive. Well, <laughs> 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 no, that was years ago. Years ago. No, I was years ago. 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 So anyway, let me just say real quickly, we're going to have to get security in here. <laughs> that all right. But hey, listen, in all seriousness, I one of the things that wasn't read in my bio is I actually, when I started my career, I started here in the 6th District. I hold these communities in the 6th District near and dear to my heart. If there's anything uh, that you have not asked tonight uh, and you want it, you think about it overnight or tomorrow, shoot me an email. Uh, I will answer your questions, and I'd be happy to come back at some point uh, if you'd like me to, to talk to talk to you all again. Thank you all very much. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate it. And by the way, when people found out that you were an attorney, uh, there were oohs and ahs, and um, a couple of people asked me why didn't I put it after your name, and I told them I think he's already got the ultimate title right now. So, but uh, quite seriously, thank you very much. Uh, for coming. Thank you for the, on your team and for the response of this uh, and coming out. And by the way, we do appreciate the work that uh, MPD has done in Penn Branch in response to this on our issues. Uh, greatly appreciate it. Uh, and for the rest of you all, so you know we've gotten the best. We, we did have Chief Newsom, which we, you all requested. Next month we will have Jeff Marod I killed his name. Marudian. Um, and those are, that's the other half of the traffic issues. 
What I do ask, and I'll be sending out an email, is that you try to get some of those questions in advance because we'd like to forward those questions to them in advance, uh, especially some of the more complicated ones because some people want exceptions to the do not enter uh, sign, and I, we understand that. So those are questions where we want to be, give them a thoughtful time to respond, uh, but we want to make sure we address it. So with that, I noticed we did have a couple of neighbors in here. Elsa Nash came in. Uh, Joan, I saw you come in. Paul, I think I saw you in the back. Uh, if there are any other questions or announcements, please let us know. Uh, and the only thing that we have to ignore, you know, like I said, we'll be updating the website. Uh, we urge you to write us at info at inbranchdc.com uh, um, or take a look at the website. All, we'll, all the executive board will be around after the meeting. We want to make sure. And then, by the way, all the videos of all of our meetings are always, are always online. So you can get the videos online. We're all accessible. You can reach out to us anytime. So look at, if you're not on the listserv, your email's back there. You'll be added to the listserv automatically. If you don't want the emails, uh, we'll take it off. But we want to make sure that we are constantly hearing from you. The only thing that we have to say is on the listserv, we send a lot of messages out, but we don't hear a lot back. And so if we're not hearing from you, it makes it very difficult. The work we really do is done in between meetings. So if you have questions, you see things you want done, let us know. One of the reasons that we have Chief Newsom here is because several people asked and wanted the, the Chief here, and he's offered to come back. So we greatly appreciate it. So uh, with that, I don't know if there's anything else. Uh, any other announcements? Okay. It's okay, Bob. Good afternoon, everybody. Good evening, excuse me. It's been a long day. Good afternoon. Good evening again. Uh, my name is Kayvon Miles, um, and I see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, happy holidays. It's good to have you all here. Um, I serve as the Ward 7 liaison to Mayor Bowser in Ward 7. Uh, I'm a born and raised uh, Ward 7 Washingtonian. Um, I went to school, uh, elementary, high school, and middle, all in Ward 7. So this is my side of town, and I'm happy to be here with you guys. What schools? I actually went to the Austin Technology Academy uh, off of East Capitol Street, uh, right in front of Clay Terrace. Uh, then I attended the Cesar Chavez Public Charter School, um, and I graduated from Thurgood Marshall Academy in Anacostia. Yes, ma'am. Um, and I'm a graduate of the University of Connecticut. Yes, I'm a Husky. I couldn't go to HD. They didn't want me there. I tried to play football there. They didn't want me. So I, I chose charter school. Um, but this week, in celebration of Black History Month, uh, this week, uh, Mayor Bowser has actually designated it as Frederick Douglass Week. Uh, so today, actually, this, uh, this afternoon, earlier this afternoon, uh, we did the groundbreaking for the new um, Frederick Douglass Memorial Bridge, uh, which is going to be a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful project. Um, if you guys want some more information, I have a number of uh, newsletters that I can pass out, and it has some detailed information. You could also visit the website. Um, but continuing with the celebration of Black History Month um, and Frederick Douglass, uh, he actually turns 200 years old tomorrow. <laughs> yes, so Frederick Douglass, his adopted birthday, he actually didn't know what his actual birthday was. Uh, and so, and, uh, I guess in commemoration and honor of him, he, he chose uh, Valentine's Day as his birthday. So tomorrow we will actually be celebrating his birthday uh, at the Wilson Building uh, with, a, with a small birthday party. And we actually have refurbished a uh, portrait of him that will be hanging in the, uh, permanently in the Wilson Building. So if you guys are available, uh, all of the information, and if you don't have one, I have plenty to hand out, uh, is available in the Mayor's Weekly Newsletter. Um, but there are a number of events taking place two on Thursday. One tomorrow, and there is an event on Saturday. We're actually opening uh, the Oxen of uh, the Oxen Run Trail Park. Um, the Auburn Mississippi Avenue is actually being named after Frederick Douglass now. So, if you guys are interested um, in participating in the 5K, it is a 5K. So, if we got any athletes, any runners, any walkers, um, you don't have to run or walk. You can do whatever you want. But if you want to participate uh, and support your community and, and, and celebrate Black History Month and celebrate. Uh, Frederick Douglass, the mayor, um, and everybody in the community will be there. Um, I think it's going to be a great event. We're supposed to have some good weather this weekend. Uh, so this should be exciting. Um, in addition, uh, it is budget season, so we have the budget uh, engagement forms coming up next week. I highly, highly, highly encourage you all to please come out uh, and send the budget engagement forms. They're a great way uh, to get to know different members, different cabinet members of your administration, see the people who are working at your agencies, and they're really, really, really Put yourself forth um, and, and in the forefront of your community. Let us know what do you want in the budget? What do you want to see in your community? You know, how do you want the budget to impact your community or impact the city as a whole? 
Um, so these will be a great opportunity. Again, all this information is listed in the mayor's newsletter. Um, and so we'll be starting actually with a senior uh, telephone form where we'll have a number of seniors who may, who may not be able to get out to the evening events or zip across town to these different locations. So we're actually holding a telephone uh, town hall for you guys first on Tuesday. Uh, it'll now take place on Tuesday, February 20th. Um, I have more detailed information as far as the number to call in and how to RSVP. Um, and then moving on from there, uh, it's actually just going to be in a row. Wednesday, Thursday, and then Saturday, we're rolling out the different uh, public engagement forms. So we'll be there. The mayor will be at each event. Um, there will be deputy mayors there. There will be directors of the agencies. They will be there also. So the, the big wigs that you want to talk to, the individuals that you want to talk to, the people who are actually influencing the budget, who are actually pulling the strings, who are uh, delivering the services to your community, they'll be there for you to, to have a conversation with. Um, and, and offer your opinion about what you think you should see or what do you want in the next budget. So that's a great opportunity. Um, as always, the private security camera program, there is plenty of money available for this. So if you guys, um, and this also applies to individuals, homeowners, and business owners. If you have already purchased the camera, um, it is a rebate. So you can bring, if you can bring your receipts um, and show us uh, you know, the proof of your purchase and your installation, um, we will still give you the money for your rebate. So please, 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 take advantage of this. Uh, I'm actually in competition with one of my colleagues at work. Um, I have a Wolf 5 motor at Bloomingdale. Um, everybody smell with Bloomingdale, correct? Right off Mill Capital Street. They have the highest number per capita in the city of uh, private security cameras. Um, and it started from this initiative. So I know for a fact that we have more residents in Penn Branch uh, because we have way more space and more houses. So I want Penn Branch to be the number one uh, community in Washington, D.C. with the highest per capita number of private security and I know that we can do it. So let's move towards that. And last but not least, 311. Guys, if you see any and everything in Ward 7, anywhere in the city, please take the time. There are five different ways that you can get in contact with 311. You can call, you can text, you can go online. Uh, you can. There's a mobile app. I'm sorry, it's so many, I forgot. <laughs> There's a mobile app. Um, and you can also do live support. So like if you open a web browser, you can actually talk to an agent right in and there from your web browser if you do it online. So there's a multitude of ways to access 311. Ward 7 has the lowest 311 units. Actually the second lowest. Ward 8 is the first. Um, but we have, Ward 7 is the largest, the largest ward in the city. Uh, but we have the lowest number of service requests. So we have a lot of infrastructure issues. We have a lot of issues that we want to be serviced and be taken care of. But we have to be vigilant. Um, and do our due diligence to make sure that these agencies know what it is that they need to come out and take care of. Uh, so it's as easy as a 30 second phone call or a minute on your mobile app just to submit a, a pothole. Today I rode up and down uh, Southern Avenue and I, I think I counted maybe 23 potholes, and I'm talking craters. Um, and, it, and it surprised me because they had been there maybe about a week or two and I actually waited just to see if somebody else would report it because potholes get filled in maybe 24 to 40 hours and a week went past and not one of these potholes were filled. So that lets me know that people aren't using 311. And that's potholes and street lights, those are some of the simplest uh, service requests to have completed. A street light you can have fixed in 24 hours. Um, and depending on the severity or the area where it is, you can come out the same day. Potholes, you can fix those in 24 to 48 hours. So if you guys know neighbors who have issues, um, and we all complain, you know, during the complaining session, let's pick up the phone and maybe dial 311 in, or let's use our mobile app. If you if you have some young people or you have other neighbors who are not as technologically savvy, get on the computer and help them, um, or or show them how to use their phones. If, they, if it's their first Apple, uh, you know, mobile application, let it be 311. So they're gonna make sure everything in their community is taken care of. So if you guys got any more questions or concerns for me, I'll be around in the back. Um, and thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks, Steve. Last but not least, one other thing, of course, is Black History Month, so I'd like to have Mr. Chandler, can you come here to the front of the room? Mr. Mr. Chandler? That's you. That, Mr. Chandler right here. So, a um, bit of history, so I don't know if you all watched uh, PBS and History Detectives, uh, but a while back, maybe two years ago, and also featured on our website, um, was a photo, an uh, 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 antique roll show, I don't know if you've seen it before, uh, it was called the Chandler Tintype. And the photo showed a Confederate, Confederate soldier and an African American man in the picture. Um, it's been circulating on our website before, um, but that picture was historical, it sold, and there was uh, a story and a video on it. And as I said, it was called Chandler Tintype, and I made it a point to ask Mr. Chandler to come up here. 
So um, if you go to pds.org and look up Chandler Tintai, um, you'll find out information about Mr. Chandler's um, great grandfather. No, he's he's not here anymore. Okay, great great grandfather, great great grandfather Chandler Tintai. So I always pride and let you know who's in our community. We have uh, Rosemary. You know, I think there was a bit of history in your family with Tuskegee Airmen. I always play like I don't know it because she's my neighbor. So if you can come to the front of the room um, for a moment. I'm just letting you know that there's uh, connections with our own neighbors that a lot of you don't know. There's history right here at Ben Branch. Ben Branch has its history, but we also have the history of our neighbors here. Uh, Rosemary, that was your... My father was an original Tuskegee Airman. 100th Fighter Squadron, 332nd Fighter Group. Wow. Right. And Mr. Chandler, that was his... I mean, great, 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 great grandfather, great, great grandfather. So you'll look. We'll be doing some refreshing on the website. Uh, we have our adopted historian Susan Hermont in the room she runs. Uh, but I, I've made her our historian. You'll see something on the Pen Avenue Development Committee uh, with Susan on the video about our neighborhood. But again, we're what we want to do is talk about the history of Penn Branch. Uh, the history of Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, but we also want for Black History Month, we just wanted to really, really let you know about the history in our neighborhood, um, and those will be appearing probably within the next week on our website, a little, little blurb about uh, your father and your great-great-grandfather. So anyway, with that, I don't want to hold the meeting up any longer. Again, uh, thank you very much, Chief Newsom, for coming. Really appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much. Chief, and I officially adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Okay. Uh,